The final part of the review is about functions, which is a special kind of relation, as we'll see the definition. And let's now see uh, what does it really mean for a relation to satisfy the so-called functional property. A relation R on set S and T, right? You can see that's a relation symbol over here. Again, you know that how to rewrite this particular set of relations in terms of the power set of pro uh, cross products, right? That's something we said earlier. Just make sure you can uh, review that part. So we said R is a relation that's between S and T. Uh, and also recall what's the smallest relation and what is the maximum relation, right? We also spoke about it. And R being a relation is also a function if it satisfies the following so-called functional property. Let's take a look. And the way we define uh, the functional property, we say that R will be functional if and only if this part over here. And we're using a universal quantification to actually define uh, what a functional property is. And we learned about universal quantification when we spoke about predicates, right? So we talk about for every S, T1, and T2, and the antecedent specify the typing constraint. So we're saying that S is a member of S. You can think about that's the uh, first set. And also T1 and T2 are both members from T. And here T1 and T2, they may not, they may or may not be the same. They may be the same, they may be different. And this the, this consequence over here is really to uh, is really talking about the functional property, right? And this part here just talk about the typing constraint. Okay? We're saying that if these two order pairs happen to be in the same relation R that we are speaking about. More precisely, you can see these two order pairs over here, the domain value over here is the same, S and S. And we're saying that if we are talking about two pairs of the same domain values, if they're both in the relation, so that means the range value T1 and T2 must be the same. So that simply means a single domain value S just cannot be mapped to more than one range values. That's basically what it is saying. I'm pretty sure you have seen this before in the earlier math course, but I'm gonna just uh, go over the de definition carefully with you uh, together. It's so important, right? Because we're also gonna talk about different kinds of a function, like uh, injection, surjection, bijection, right? One thing at a time. One possible interpretation, let's look at this uh, imprecation symbol over here. Okay, so this part is really, really the formal way of saying it is forbidden for a member of S to map to more than one members of T because we're saying that if T1 and T2 both must be mapped, uh, if you look at T1 over here and T2, if both of them must be mapped by S, then the only possibility is T1 is equal to T2, just this, just one member. However, we can interpret this functional property slightly differently but equivalently. Let me show it to you, okay? So that's the uh, functional property over here. And let me ask you, one of the uh, theorems I listed uh, in the propositional part of the lecture for the review. We spoke about something called contrapositive. It's a theorem, right? So I would suggest we take a look at this part over here because it's an, an imprecation. And according to contrapositive, hey, do you know what, what it is equivalent to? Well, contrapositive just reminds you quickly, P implies Q, is equivalent to not Q implies not P, right? That's something we spoke about earlier, right? And of course, you can prove it if you wish, but let's uh, skip that part. And how can we now rewrite the functional property based on contrapositive? So that means T1 not equal to T2 implies, well, you can see this is the uh, consequence Oh, actually, let me highlight better. So this is a consequence, and this is the antecedent, right? So uh, just highlight the whole antecedent over here. Okay, better. Okay, so now we can say T1 not equal to T2 implies the negation of this particular part, right? The negation is uh, like this. S, T1, and also we can apply the Morgan, right? Because we're gonna use a uh, we're gonna use a negation uh, distribute negation over conjunction, right? We also learned about De Morgan. S T one not equal to R or S T two not equal to R. Okay, I can definitely write better over here. It's R. 
okay? Or, okay, disjunction, okay? All right, how do we interpret this? We are saying that if we got two range values over here, right, we are simply saying it's simply just not possible that T1 and T2 are mapped by the same domain value. If somehow you say ST1, ST, uh, ST2, we want to make sure at least one of them must not be in the relation because if they are both in the same relation, in that case, we got S mapped to different T1 and T2, right? Hopefully you can see my interpret. Let me say that again. You can either interpret this way over here, as I just explained when I went over the slides, we can interpret that over uh, in this way using contrapositive. Uh, using the equivalent theorem over here. So this way, how do you uh, interpret that? If we got two range values, T1 and T2, they're distinct, they're different. It's simply not possible that T1 and T2 are simply mapped by the same S domain value, and also both of them are actually in the same relation. No, it's, it's gonna be that either one of them must be not in the relation. That's why we'll say not a member of, and then it's gonna be disjunction. Remember, the only way for uh, disjunction to be false is actually when both are actually false. When both are actually false, that means this is a member of R, this is also a member of R. In that case, you actually got S mapped to different values, which is not allowed for a function, right? Enough about intuition and also contrapositive. All right, please think about uh, this really interpretation again. So sometimes we might just look at the definition and thought we actually understood it. But I think uh, you really want to dive into it and see different ways of interpreting the same thing. Let's now go back to uh, slides and exactly what I just said over here, but in a much more detailed way in the iPad, right? You can uh, review it if necessary. Let's now take a look at some example, okay? Let's say we got S, the first set, one, two, three, and also T, A, B, right? Which of the following relations, and each one of them we're gonna speak about, is gonna be a member of a relation between S and T, right? And let's uh, uh, see uh, which one. Oh, and you know, before that, let me just say one more thing, which I forgot, I really meant to uh, ask you, okay? Let me put a question over here. What is, the smallest relation satisfying the functional property all right over here you can see here we're going to talk about smallest relation that satisfy the functional property well, in some way, it should be quite easy for you to guess even, because since I'm talking about the smallest set of some sort, and it's it's not a bad guess if you simply say empty set, right? And you're actually right, it's actually empty relation, okay? And I mean, the, the answer is empty set, but you should really know why, okay? I think the reason about why empty relation is actually a uh, smallest relation that always satisfies the functional property, the why is actually more important than what, okay? empty relation, okay? And I want to link this to when we talk about how to prove or disapprove the quantification, right? We talk about how you can prove or disapprove uh, universal or dis uh, existential quantification. And now you can see the functional property over here is a universal quantification, right? Over here. And specifically, how do you disprove it? To disprove, we said that you need to find witness. To find a witness that is going to actually violate this particular property over here, right? Of course, given that we want to find a witness such that it will satisfy the antecedent, the typing constraint, and however, it's going to dis, uh, violate this particular uh, property, right? Find a witness satisfying Find a witness satisfying the antecedents, right? This is the antecedent we talk about over here, but violating the consequence, right? 
you can see the consequence is uh, exactly over here. But now, how can the consequence be false over here? How can we find, okay? In the case of empty relation, are you able to find any witness that is actually going to satisfy this but violate this? Are you able to find any witness? No, because empty relation, by its very definition, you cannot find anything in there. It's empty. Since you cannot find any witnesses to disprove that it is not a function, then it must be a function. All right, that's the logic, okay? Let me write it down. Because we cannot find any witness to disprove it, disprove that, it violates the functional property. So, empty relation is a function. Right, the logic is actually somehow a little bit different. Well, it's like more like a, 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 a like a edge case, like a boundary case. We cannot find any witness to disprove it. That means it must be a function. All right, that's a very important actually edge case for you to consider. Okay. All right, let's now move back. Let's now consider different relations over here to see if they satisfy the functional property or not. The first one. If I get s cross uh, s cross product t, that will be the maximum relation between s and t, right? Is it uh, does it satisfy the functional property? Well, you can pause the video and think about it. Proof will disprove it, basically. Well, it should be no. What will be the witness? Well, as long as you can find member order pairs in s product uh, cross product t such that the same domain value will actually map to different range value. In that case, it will violate the uh, functional property, right? In that case, I got many witnesses over here for you, right? You can see, for example, you can, uh, you would, uh, 1A, 1B are definitely members in the S cross product T. In that case, the same domain value over here, you can see the same uh, ST1, ST2. In this case, S will be one over here, and also T1 and also T2, are basically A and B respectively. According to the definition, T1 must be equal to T2, but in our case, A and B are not uh, A and B are not equal to each other, apparently. So that's why it's violation of the functional property, right? So that's a witness. And of course, as uh, whenever you are supposed to disprove something, uh, in that case, only one witness will be enough. Of course, depending on how many witnesses you might be required to actually supply. Maybe you, the question simply asks you to give all the possible witnesses, right? But at least one logically will be sufficient. Right? You can similarly can con consider witness number two and also witness number three over here. It's really important. Again, think about three and three over here being S and S over here, right? The same domain value. T1 and T2 over here are basically A and B over here, according to the functional property, because three is equal to three, in that case, A must be equal to B, according to the definition. But A definitely is not equal to B. They are not equal. In that case, it's a violation, all right? Second one. And this one here, uh, maybe I don't need any illustration on the paper. So uh, let's now talk about it, okay? This will be the maximum relation, well, all the combination of are the first and second elements drawn from S and T, right? By the way, what will be the size for this particular cross product, right? Just for, by the way, right? That's something we learned earlier because we got three possibility for the first element. We got two possibility for the second elements. So that two, uh, three times two, that'll be six, right? And now we want to do a set difference. We want to get rid of from this particular set, the following set over here. And this will just be another relation. We are using the set comprehension notation. The relation is going to be all the order pairs such that, first of all, it's going to be a member of the cross product. That's okay. But right? that one simply say X should be a member of S. And also Y should be a member of T. Uh, should be a member of T. But we got some additional constraint over here, which will be X must be equal to one. So that means we want to get rid of all the pairs in uh, S product, uh, 
So the resulting relation over here is going to be just another relation, right? Another set of pairs. Except that we want to keep everything in S cross, cross product T except those that are uh, where the first element is equal to one. So that'll be basically the two and three, right? It can be two A, two B, and also three A, three B, right? So that'll be the resulting relation. Hopefully you're okay with that. So I don't need, I don't need to write it down for you. And in this case, is it functional? Apparently not. Witnesses, well, apparently, well, I already said it to you. So it can be 2A, 2B, right? You can see the two over here is simply not equal to one. So just to make sure you understand that. And given that two is the same as two, S is the same as S over here, but A is not equal to B as opposed to this is equal to that, right? So there's a violation. And similarly for this, so we got two witnesses uh, in this case over here. That's the second witness. All right, another exercise over here. What about this one over here? Is it a function? Well, this is more like a numeration of the other members, so you can double def, definitely double check. One is only mapped to just one element in the range, which is just A. Two is only mapped to one, which is B. Three is only mapped to, uh, mapped to a unique element in the range, which is A. So we don't have any violations so far. You might be wondering, but we got A and also A here. Wouldn't that violate the functional property? No. It violates, which we'll see, the so-called injective property. It's, uh, so this is still a function, but later on, you can think about this is one example where it is a function, but it is not a injective function. All right. And to really judge whether or not there should be a function, you should really focus more on the domain value over here. So for domain value one, we only got one pair. For domain value two, we only got one pair. For domain value three, we only got one pair. So whether or not different domain values map to the same range value is not our concern right now, right? It wouldn't uh, invalidate that being a function, okay? So this is a function, all right? What about a final example? What about 1A, 1B? Well, similar, you can see one is uniquely mapped to A. My, one, uh, one does not map to anything other than A, good. And two does not map to anything other than B. So that's also uh, satisfying the uh, this uh, property over here, all right? Right, so that'll be yes as well. All right, so this slide here just basically summarizes about a very basic property about being functional, which is fundamental. And then in the, uh, in the coming slides, we're gonna talk about three different kinds of uh, functions. Injective, uh, injection, surjection, and bijection.